thank you for being here. We're really excited to see so many of you here and so many of you on Zoom. Um, this year, the library will be celebrating its 50th anniversary of our art show, one of the five major fundraisers for the library. Tonight's fabulous program on Dutch art kicks off our celebration of the show's anniversary, and what a wonderful way it is going to be to begin. We hope you will join us to view the art during Art Show Week, beginning with the Golden Jubilee Preview Reception on Friday, December 2nd, and there will be special programs throughout the week. Um, ending with a closing reception on Sunday, December 11th. So for more details on those programs, um, to get tickets and reservations, go to our website. So, and now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Laura Poizina Conley. Laura grew up in the Netherlands where she studied law as well as Dutch 17th century art. After retiring from a 20 year career with a scholarly publishing company in New York City, she became a docent at the Metropolitan Museum, where she gives tours of the American wing and European paintings and galleries. She still visits the Netherlands frequently to see family and friends, including those on the walls of many Dutch art museums. And I want to ask Laura about that later. Laura and her husband, Henry, spend many weekends and all summer in Reading, immersed in their garden, and we are delighted to have her here with us this evening. So join me in welcoming Laura. Thank you very much, Elaine. It's wonderful for me to be here at the Mark Twain Library to see all of you here and those of you on Zoom. And I'm inviting you on a stroll past some paintings of Dutch seven, the Dutch 17th century. Now, this is in no way a talk about art history. See it as a visit to some old favorites and maybe you'll learn something new about them. I am also not necessarily treating what we are going to see in chronological order. So with that, when you look at this screen, I think you know many, if not all, of these paintings. Now, what they have in common is that they are all highly detailed, they um, are very realistic, and they deal with everyday subjects. It is really a mirror of the daily life of the Netherlands in the 17th century. Much of this was at that time in the early 17th century quite new, and you may not realize this. Think of it. Here, when you see a Greek vase or a, a bust from Rome, we are dealing with usually gods and heroes and mythological stories, very important people. And the same is still true in the times from Byzantium through the Renaissance. On the left, of course, religion, important people in the middle, and on the right, mythology. Now, at all, in all these um, civilizations, there were, of course, exceptions. On the left, the delightful, as she is called, Bikini Girl. <laughs> she is a mosaic in the floor of a villa in Sicily. Many of you, I'm sure, have visited it. And on the right, of course, is one page of the Book of Hours of for the uh, Duc de Berry. And here we have the month of July, and you see people working in the field. But these exceptions were a very, very minor part of the artistic output of all these uh, eras. Now, why is there then, is the art scene in the um, Netherlands, if I can call it that, in the Dutch Republic in the early 17th century, why is it so different? What has happened? Why is there such blossoming of the visual arts? Well, for that, we have to look a little bit at history and I will move fast here, so don't worry. Um, in the 16th century, the mid 1500s, the 17 United Provinces, of which you see them, you see them all here, were ruled by the Spanish Habsburgs. Here on the left, Charles V, and then later his son Philip II. Now, Philip II um, increase, got increasingly intolerant towards the Protestants who lived in the northern part of the country, I'll flip back for a second, the north of that red line, about 60% of the population was at this point Protestant. The south was pretty much totally Catholic. But Philip became more and more intolerant of Protestantism in the north. And uh, it became so bad that Protestants in the north at some point got together in 1566 and in many different cities started storming the Catholic churches. And they, as you can see here on this picture, they smashed a lot of statues, they smashed windows, they took out paintings, they took out statues. It was the great iconoclasm. Now, that wasn't all. 
there was more that rubbed the north the wrong way about Spanish rule. And that was its very autocratic and centralized uh, way of governing. That was alien to the northern provinces that had always had been ruled very much, uh, or I would say the shots would have been called by merchants and bankers and traders in the cities. So in um, 1568, full-scale revolt breaks out. The Dutch revolt, the leader is this fellow on the left, the famous William the Silent, William of Orange. And I couldn't resist to put his direct descendant here, the present <laughs> king of the Netherlands, <laughs> Willem Alexander. So um, what happened within 10, 15 years, the North was actually very successful and they were able to liberate many of the cities in the North from Spanish rule. And that prompted the uh, Northern provinces to declare themselves independent as the Dutch Republic. Um, that, this Republic of course was not recognized by Spain. And the war that had started in 68 raged on in total, it was an 80 years war. There were sporadic battles. Now, what happened um, in this little green circle, that is the city of Antwerp. And this, th this thing is a pointer, right? Yes. Um, press the red line. Oh, yeah. Uh, here, do you see that? Is this river that comes out in the sea here, right above my red line. That is the access to the port of Antwerp. And that makes Antwerp such a success in international trade and hence culture. Sure. And Antwerp was a big deal. But even though Antwerp was um, hit very, very hard several times by the Spanish and then by the Dutch, here you see the Spanish fury, Spanish people attacking the burghers of Antwerp. Ultimately, Antwerp uh, remained in Spanish hands, but the Dutch were able to keep the port blockaded. Um, that meant that all the trade of Antwerp dried up very quickly. And it was mainly a very, very active trade with England, lots of textile and also other countries. So what's happening? Um, international trade moved north to Amsterdam and many merchants follow. Um, artists follow. When the merchants leave, of course, all kinds of other people who make life possible for them leave also. So tremendous exodus from Antwerp to the north to Amsterdam. Here we have Amsterdam in the mid 1500s, a small provincial city, but now it is growing and expanding into a major cultural and commercial capital. Look how it is about 100 years later. Excuse me. The green line is the line that the previous picture had. The yellow line is uh, a good 100 years later, and you can see how they have built canals circling the city on the right. And later on, they actually continued even further. And then the side canals that go, that sort of go up there like parts of a fan um, here. Whoops, sorry. Um, so what was happening? This, uh, if we sum it up, we can see here on the bottom, this big amount of water. That is Het A. That is the name of the big body of water that links Amsterdam with the sea, or at least did way back then. And that made it possible for this very small country, only about one and a half million inhabitants, to uh, build a worldwide network of seafaring trade routes. What was the result? The citizens became extremely rich. They had built these houses and they of course want to decorate these houses. And um, the burghers are incredibly wealthy. Um, demand for paintings is skyrocketing. There were also many, many artists. In the past, artists of course had been living off commissions from the church and from the various courts and aristocracy, but the church was no longer in any way uh, um, asking for paintings. The Protestants didn't allow any embellishment in the churches. So all these artists have now to compete on a, an open market and compete they did. They competed madly and they even invented entirely new genres. Um, a foreign visitor once remarked that even the simplest house had paintings. Why? Because they were cheap. So 
Uh, at the same time, you have to realize that there were still many painters who made paintings in an older style of more uh, generally um, to topics that had been dealt with over the centuries, history paintings, allegories, mythologies, and so on. But that's another story, and we're not going to talk about those in this uh, visit to. So let's look in this mirror on daily life, which basically is, um, I call it that because the art of this time so much deals with regular people. It, let's look at this mirror of daily life with its realism, its infinite detail, and day-to-day -day subjects. So we'll start here. Um, Couple in the Inn by Franz Hals. Hals family was one of the families that had moved north from Antwerp in the 1580s. And here now in the 1620s, Hals paints this couple. Um, it's a large painting. It's um, at least four feet high, if not more. But yet we feel very close to it. And Hals does that because he crops the painting quite severely. That makes us feel part of the scene. Um, notice how he encases those two, how he focuses your attention on these two heads. See that big blue feather that is draped around their heads? Um, no self-respecting Dutchman would have worn a hat with a feather like that. This is completely Hals's imagination. Um, what does he do? This couple is standing still and yet they have tremendous life. I have the feeling they're jumping out at us or moving any second. Well, Hals does that because he gives us a very strong light diagonal. Look at it. Do you see the light fingernails of the man? And then the stripe on the nose of the dog, the white cuff of the man, then the white cuff of the woman, and then up to the cuff, the, the collar of the man and his hand more white, and at the end, the very glimmer of the beer glass. That very strong diagonal moves our eyes up and makes it so that this is far from a static picture. Now, in the distance here, in, in the background, is the innkeeper. And he, the, he has a low life establishment, surely, but there is art on the walls. Do you see the landscape painting on the chimney? So these two people are stereotypes. These are not portraits, yet they are very real. They're, they're in the moment. It's, it's really like a snapshot. Now, I feel that I can hear the noise in that inn and I can just smell that beer. <laughs> but now we need to ask, why in the world did Hals paint this? Well, there was a famous poem and there was also actually a play going around at the time. And here's an engraving of it from the 1590s of a, a young man who uh, leaves home and lives it up for a while, a sort of a prodigal son story. It was very popular. And Hals has certainly seen this. Um, it is the engraving on the bottom says what you can see here. And it says the nuzzle of dogs, the love of whores, and the hospitality of innkeepers, none of it comes without cost. Let me try to point it out on the screen. Here, the woman embracing this man who was hanging in a chair, dogs here, and then here the innkeeper who is bringing in whatever he's bringing, I can't quite do it. Yeah, here, there, a bowl of whatever it is. So it is basically a little bit of a moral. So um, this, this couple is an example of a very new type of painting. It's comical, but it's a little bit moralistic. It has an undertone, but it really was meant to amuse. And uh, very confusingly, we call this a genre painting. And a genre painting is really nothing but a painting of a situation of people that are not a portrait. Now, um, there were... The wealthy burghers in these big canal houses certainly wanted to show off and they wanted to have paintings of themselves. But how do you choose a painter? Well, at this time, there were already art galleries in Amsterdam and uh, these art galleries would show works of various painters in among them, of course, Rembrandt. Here is one of his self-portraits, a drawing at a very young age. And um, Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam at age 26 and he needs clients. So 
Here, he paints what we might call a marketing piece. He paints this huge portrait. It's easily five feet high. Uh, pardon me, I say portrait, this huge uh, man, because it's emphatically not a portrait. We'll get to that in a minute. And he paints this to show off what he can do. Um, we see this exotic figure. He exudes great uh, authority, pearl earrings, lips tightly set, brow furrowed. Um, he's wearing a Turkish crescent there. And here you can see very well how Rembrandt deals with texture, how incredibly well he can create that shawl, which is probably silk, shot through with silver. And that contrasts with the fur. Actually, I just noticed we still have so many lights on. Could we turn some off because you could see it so much better? I forgot. <laughs> better? <laughs> Sorry, totally forgot. Um, well, now you can see the fur under the crescent and next to it, the damask of that robe. Um, Rembrandt gives this man a tremendous depth and he does that because he really paints with light. We call this, of course, as you know, chiaroscuro and he puts a dark background where the figure is light, like on the left shoulder, our left and vice versa on the right, so light in the background so it's a darker um, shoulder. Um, but again, like with the painting of the uh, uh, young couple in the inn with, for, by Franz Hals, again, we should ask why in the world did Rembrandt in Holland, in Amsterdam, paint a man in oriental costume to show all the wonderful things he can do? Well, there are many reasons for it. And they're actually, to me, quite amusing and wonderful. Rembrandt, first of all, loved costumes. If you've ever been in Amsterdam and you've gone to the Rembrandt house, you might have seen a big crate in which he kept outlandish costumes. And um, we know that he had access to engravings of paintings of Italians such as Titian or Tintoretto, who sometimes um, depicted people in uh, Eastern costumes. He also had costume books. We know that. He owned this one. And this is done by none other than a nephew of Titian. You can see the name Vicelio. This is Cesare Vicelio who made this, co this costume book in the 1590s. And here is his page of the Persian nobleman. I couldn't resist to show you the Dutch nobleman in Cesare's uh, uh, vision. So this is what Raymond does. Um, he paints not a portrait, and not a historical person, but a Dutch model. The man probably lives down the street. And we know that Raymond actually used this model in other paintings. So this, but despite his Dutch face, the uh, educated Dutch at the time would have recognized this man or this painting as a, um, an Eastern um, Turkish or Persian nobleman or a prince. And that is because just a few years er earlier in 1526, a, an Eastern, a Middle East delegation had come to Amsterdam. It was a trading delegation and they had had a parade in phenomenally wonderful costumes that apparently had set the burghers on fire. So, oh, we've never seen anything like this. And they remembered that. So this face would have been recognized. Um, there was something else going on. These character heads in Dutch are called tronies. I spelled it there on the left. They were very, very popular. They are nothing but little sketches of funny expressions, sad expressions, old age, or just people in outlandish costumes. Again, very popular. Another, a type of painting that still at that time was highly regarded was, of course, the, uh, his, the um, a history painting, just a, a big scene of something that had happened. Now, um, and they, the history paintings could be images of real or imagined historical events and religious paintings basically are part of that historical events. So what is Rembrandt doing? He is combining all these genres together. He is painting a character head, a Tony, and it will refer right away for many people to that uh, Turkish, uh, that Persian or Turkish, we don't quite know what it was, delegation that really happened. So a history painting and a character study with which he shows off his tremendous powers of description and his uh, virtuoso technique. 
So does this get Rembrandt commissions? It surely does. Right away, he paints these two ordinary burgers. They're oval, about two feet high, painted on wood. Oval is very popular at the time. And um, he is looking somewhat bemused, maybe a bit skeptical. To me, she looks a bit bashful. Now, of course, portraits were not a new genre. Portraits have been painted for centuries before this. But what was new at this point is that ordinary burgers are portrayed. Yes, they may be ordinary burgers, but they must be fairly wealthy because they're wearing black. This is not just poor, poor black. Um, wearing black was a sign of wealth because it was an extremely expensive process to create a good black fabric that would hold the blackness. You know that when you wash dark clothes too often, they don't remain black. Well, there you go. The other thing that shows their wealth is these colors, these fabulous millstone colors, as we call them. They were made with 15 yards each of pure white linen, very, very fine linen. And um, those things would be attached to something like a dog collar. And sometimes there was some wire involved as well. Now, this, of course, was definitely a sign of wealth. And here, it is actually depicted on a tile. I just love this woman who is trying to <laughs> stay up with a thing around her neck. Now, linen cost a fortune. Why? Well, this gets us to a very different painting, and it is this one from uh, 1670 to 75 by Jacob van Raarsdal. Sorry, we have to. And what we see here is in the distance, the city of Haarlem, and in front, the bleaching fields. Um, it's a day of sun and clouds. And bands of light and dark in the foreground, somewhat diagonally, leads, lead our eyes into the distance where we can see the city and that big church, which is uh, the um, St. Bavo Cathedral. Um, at this point, the fashion for millstone colors is long gone, but Harlem has remained a major center for the bleaching of linen, which Rarsdale depicts here in the foreground. Now, Rarsdale certainly sketched outside, but he didn't paint inside. And he um, finished his painting inside. And he just describes this little farm so lovingly. Whether it looked like that or not, we have no idea. Rarsdale could have added or subtracted. But anyway, he gives it a lot of attention. And in front of it, you see all these bands of linen uh, there on the ground and little sm very small people, or at least we see them as very small, uh, milling around doing whatever they need to do for this process of bleaching linen. Now linen, when um, it is spun and woven, is extremely filthy. So it's cleaned and bleached. That process took vast quantities of lye and buttermilk. And some historian has determined that the linen bleaching industry in Harlem used 100,000 quarts of buttermilk a year. Now, but what does that do to the land? There would be runoff. What happens to the ditches where people get their water to drink? Well, what do you do? You don't drink the water, but you drink beer. Simple. <laughs> the Dutch drank enormous quantities of beer. It was a low alcohol uh, variety, and um, even children drank, drank beer regularly. Not only did the Dutch like beer, they loved wine. And here we see a, a picture by Willem Klasso and Heda of the um, 15, uh, I think it is, did I have to, 1635, pardon me. And it is nothing but a little, uh, very, um, a little piece with stuff on the table, very few colors, quite muted. And this becomes another entirely new genre, the standalone still life. This really reflects the Dutch passion for detail and realism. Now, of course, still lives have been painted for centuries before this. Here you see a still life from that wonderful uh, fresco of Bosco Reale that you can see in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. But you see it under my yellow arrow there on the right, and then I enlarged it on the left. It was always part of a much bigger scene. Still, standalone still life, that's something new. 
Now here, the light really dances over all this uh, polished silver and glistening oysters and reflective glass. And in the glass, you can actually see the reflection of the window. You notice it there in the middle? Um, you might see, might notice that the bumps on that big glass and uh, that there are bumps on the foot of the big glass in the middle. Uh, they have a reason. At the time, eating with forks was not all that common. And so you would very often have greasy hands. So if you now grab a wine glass with all these bumps, you have much more chance that it stays in your hands if you've had one too many. <laughs> now this glass in Dutch is called a roemer, R-O-E-M-E-R. And a rumor becomes a status symbol. And you will see it in many, many paintings of that, uh, Dutch paintings of this period. If you look at some painting on your own sometime and you look at, you see a table with glasses, you will find a rumor. So um, all this is in very muted tones of grays and browns. And look at the metalwork here, the, the pounding in and out that repoussé, that pushed back, uh, which we can see on the bottom pushed from the inside out, and on the top we see the, uh, the uh, outside, the result of this. Um, the pewter plate here is balanced uh, off the table. Do you see the edge is way off the table? It comes into our space. And that really serves to invite us into this wonderful feast for the eye, and we can start to dig in. It makes us again feel close to it. Um, now look at that lemon curl. Why that lemon curl? Well, when I grew up, when I was a little kid in Holland, um, we were told and taught to peel apples and oranges, not so much lemons because you don't really eat a lemon for dessert. Um, we would peel those in one fell swoop. You just go around with your knife. And then when you were done, you would carefully throw that peel over your left shoulder and the peel would end up on the floor and the letter it would form would be the first initial of the name of the person you would marry. <laughs> now, needless to say, we always were sure to marry Sam's or Simon's or Sally's. <laughs> um, so, but we need to look more carefully here. Do you see the diagonal spoon peeking out there from the, uh, there, big spoon? That points to a glass that's lying down and it's broken. Um, the glass is broken. The um, oysters, some of them are finished. The lemon will surely shrivel up pretty quickly because it's already exposed to the air. And that little cone is a page from an almanac that, and that cone holds peppercorns, by the way. And the page from an almanac, of course, is counting of the days. In other words, the painter Heda is really reminding us of swiftly passing pleasures. Life is short. So here again, we have a moral lesson combined in this, in this case with the signs of a privileged lifestyle that the owner of this picture either enjoyed or far more likely would like to be identified with. Now, still lives with a moral lesson were just one subgenre that came up in the 17th century. Another subgenre was this still life of um, trophies of the hunt on the left, and of course, many, many flower pieces on the right. Um, but the Sternbergers who we met earlier sometimes wanted some fun and they wanted something more cheerful in their wonderful canal houses. So what might they have had? Jan Steen's dissolute household, maybe. Now this is such a terrific painting because it shows us so many things. Uh, Jan Steen is really regaling us to all the favorite flaws of the Dutch. And we'll get into detail in a second. But he also shows us the amount of luxury that is available in the 17th century. Again, this is not a portrait. There's only one person looking at us, the man in the middle, that's the painter himself, Jan Steen. And next to Steen is his wife, that gorgeously dressed woman who is leaning over backwards. And you can see the um, fabric of her skirt and her bodice that must be shot through with silver. And then what looks to me like ermine that borders her shawl, her pink shawl. This of course stands for vanity. Now, 
what is she doing? She's focusing on her drink. The maid is pouring her a drink. Um, but she is not noticing the somewhat amorous entanglement <laughs> of Jan Steen and the maid. And this is reinforced by the fact that the curtain of the bed behind it is lifted. So this surely points to lust. Our dinner is finished and the old lady on the left has fallen asleep, sloth. The boy on the far left is tickling the woman with a stick under her nose and the other boy is showing a beggar away. That stands for poor parenting skills. <laughs> Now look at this cat, wastefulness. And worse, the woman has her foot on a Bible, sacrilege. Then we see the lute. It has a broken string. I hope I can show it to you. Here, you see the string? That, of course, is discord. And then on the floor, a watch, time ticking away, and a broken glass, nothing lasts forever. Um, all remind us of mortality. Now, look here. This Chinese bowl, way for sin, loaded with uh, exotic fruits, peaches, uh, oranges, I mean, not that common in, uh, well, the peaches, yes, but the oranges, surely not. And um, this, of course, points to gluttony and also the corruptive nature of luxury. Now, no, do you notice the lemon peel in the front? There we go again. Now, all these flaws indicate a disorderly household, a huge sin in prim and proper Holland. But fate literally hangs overhead. I have put an arrow at this very strange contraption, which is a basket filled with instruments of justice and punishment. We have a sword and a switch, a crutch and a begging bull can foretell a life of misery. Jack of spades certainly for, portends evil. And there is a wooden clapper, that thing that hangs on the left, that is the clapper that a leper would use to warn you that, he, that you shouldn't come too close. So all this could happen really as soon as that cord on which his basket hangs is snapped. This family might be in misery. Now, this kind of comic scene of a household that has run amok um, shows you what happens when appetites go unchecked. But the proper burghers who bought such paintings really did not need this to remind them not to behave this way. Rather, having it in the house might give them the fun of looking at a really comic scene that they knew would never apply to them. And to this day, of course, in Holland, a messy room elicits the comment from a parent, uh, this looks like a household of Jan Steen. So um, this for the disorderly side, but these proper burghers also spent an awful lot of time in church. The Protestants had long services, but the churches at this point were not uh, sacred places to worship a deity. They were places to get together and to learn together. And painting interiors of churches became a new genre in the 17th century. This is the old church, the interior of the old church in Delft. Excuse me. Um, did um, notice that we are in this church and we are looking with, um, the painter gives us a diagonal view and that makes these pillars really soar up. It's a hugely high building. And we notice that, of course, there is no art that has all been destroyed 100 years earlier, and the church has been whitewashed. That all happens in 1566. Um, instead, we see some uh, civic banners way up, in, in, up high there, and we see these crests hanging on the pillars that probably refer to the families of the people who are buried in uh, graves in the floor. Um, but here you can see little detail. The window, no longer stained glass with all kinds of scenes in it, but the sun is shining through the window and you see a bit of red. You see a red roof on a dark building and a little bit of blue and white sky. And the white stone is really luminous here. Now look at these boys. They are scribbling graffiti on these pillars. A dog is doing its business. 
<laughs> and all this near an open grave, which may well be a bit of a reminder of mortality. Now, he gives us the people very, very small. These groups of people are very small. And that makes us feel even more that this church is very, very high. But look up at the ceiling, at the vault. And you will notice that it is made of wood. Dutch soil is way too wet to support a stone roof. Here you see a, an area in Holland, a very small area in the north of, of Holland. I shouldn't say Holland, the Netherlands, but it comes so easily. Um, it is still this way, it's a very small area. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it really shows you how the land would have been in the 15, 1600s. Of course, lots and lots of water. Now, water played an incredibly important role in this low-lying country. Since the 1500s, the Dutch have created polders by drying out bogs and even parts of the sea with dikes. This created space for agriculture and dairy, and therefore income. Of course, the rivers and canals served to transport the goods, and the sea was very important for international trade and warfare. So it results that the burghers were incredibly proud of their land and the water, which made it that images of landscapes became increasingly popular and various genres and subgenres of landscapes and seascape paintings emerged. Of course, that again had started earlier. You may all know this painting, Bruegel's Harvesters in the Metropolitan Museum. This is an early landscape and there is a church. You see it behind the darkest part of the tree, but the church is definitely no longer the center of the painting. Um, but gradually, these landscapes morph into more and more landscapes on their own until they become so incredibly popular uh, in the next century. One type of landscape here, an ice scape. It is a, a, a scene of, of course, ice skating in a village by the painter Hendrik Averkamp, who happened to be a deaf mute. Incredibly popular, very successful. About 1610, so we're early here. And we are standing high up and we're looking at this big scene into a far distance on a frosty day. And we see rich and poor milling around. Uh, some are working and some are having fun. And some boats are actually partially frozen in the ice. Look at this man. I love the guy who's skating right towards us with this glimmering golden jacket and this crazy hat. And um, hope he's not going to fall. In the middle, you see two men on, in, on that diagonal line who are playing a game called Kolf, K-O-L-F. And that's uh, sort of something between uh, hockey and golf. And in the middle is an old fellow, between the two is an old fellow on a brick sled who uh, is apparently unaware of the fact that he might very well be hit by a golf puck pretty quickly. Now, here on the right, and I have to show you this so you don't miss it. Here you see three women, hand in hand, skating happily forward, but the one on the left is taking a nose dive, thereby exposing her derriere to us. And on the left in the foreground, you see a woman who is using a hole that has been cut in the ice to do her washing. Um, so in the, in the distance, pardon me, I'm too warm. In the distance, the colors are getting ever lighter and the details fuzzier. Uh, there is a suggestion of a town on the horizon line. And this is how Avrakamp uh, creates this vast sense of a very vast space. Now I can get extremely happily lost in looking at all these individual figures, all the little details. And it reminds me of my skating days when I grew up and Holland was still cold in the winter in my high school days. And we made these trips from town to town on the ice. Now, the kind of fun that I have with these paintings and really looking at individual scenes and funny little stereotypes is exactly what these painters, such as Avrakamp, had in mind. They wanted to amuse the viewers. They wanted to invite them into these easy, lively situations in peaceful settings and familiar landscapes, or in this case, of course, a seascape. 
Another new genre, a subgenre of landscape, is these very small landscapes. Um, very simple scenes, again, muted colors, uh, down home scenes. Um, here we have one by a fellow named Anthony van der Kroos of some fishermen busy with their net. And our eyes are led into the painting again by vaguely diagonal bands of light and dark to that church in the distance. The church is near Voorburg, which is not far from The Hague. Um, you can see that the foreground is painted with a lot of detail, the fishermen and especially the tree. And in the distance, uh, Kors doesn't do that. that. That foliage down there, which is a little too gray in this painting, it's actually a little greener, but I couldn't get it any better. Um, he paints that with much less detail. I noticed that sky all shot through with pink. Now, this picture has been in my family for more than a century. My father bought it at an auction in 1912, and he was accompanied, accompanied by friends of uh, his who were art historians, and they couldn't figure out by who it was, but my father liked it and bought it. My mother then, in the 1950s, decided to have it cleaned, and it was, was sent to a conservator at the Dutch Museum, who took off a huge golden frame that was around this that had obstructed a piece and there became the signature. And um, she, the conservator, deciphered it and it is a, an A and then a V with a dot, a thumb, cross C R O O S, um, 1667. This picture is still hanging in our apartment in New York. Um, Amsterdam had become, of course, with all this trade and all this seafaring, a center of shipbuilding as well. And painters of merchant ships and warships um, became very, very in, if you will, and very wealthy because they could paint technically correct paintings of these ships that had made these burgers so wealthy. So if you were um, important in the maritime trade, you wanted to own a picture of one of your ships done to the nth degree, and they did. Well, um, and it showed, of course, the source of your wealth. That was the main reason in those days. Uh, Jan van der Capelle here paints um, the ships, the fleet uh, saluting the state barge at 1650. And he gives us a row of big ships at anchor, as far as the eye can see, done in great perspective under an imposing and cloudy sky. Two yachts in front are firing a salute for the functionaries who are rowing by in that state barge. Now look, from the Capella's water is always mirror calm. And he allows it to act as a mirror of his sky and his people. I have a feeling he decides, if I know all that detail, I might give, as well give it to you twice. And uh, this effect, this mirror-like effect in the water was Santa Capella's specialty. Now, in my memory, this is not the norm in the Netherlands, where it's usually quite stormy. Now we get, uh, we are talking about a very different genre, the self-portrait. Really, the 17th century selfie. A selfie may be a contemporary look, but the self-portrait, of course, was also already popular in the Renaissance. And it is not a new genre in the dark 17th century. But however, it becomes particularly popular among Dutch painters and uh, people buy them like hotcakes. Now in any self-portrait, you must choose how you want to present yourself. But unlike today's selfies, um, in the 17th century, self-portraits were very carefully constructed fictions of identity. And they were designed to present a lasting impression. Self-portraits were painted because people loved them. But also, of course, if you're a painter and you're starting out, a self-portrait is a good way to get practice because a mirror is a whole lot cheaper than hiring a model. Now, remember, we've already seen the tronies, that very popular genre of character heads. You could use a self-portrait to create a trony. And that gets us to a very interesting question. To me, very interesting. This portrait is in the Metropolitan, by the way. And here we can ask. Sure, it's a Rembrandt self-portrait, we know that. 
But does it look like him or is he giving us a character head? Of course, we will never know. It's entirely possible that he combines the two. Um, Rembrandt painted himself at least 80 times and used uh, in drawing and painting, uh, not, not 80 paintings, but lots and lots of drawings also. And um, he used them as a calling card and also to show off his skills. And they were actually sold to his patrons. He's here 54 years old. And here in a portrait in Kenwood House in, outside of London, he is 59. Um, in both of these, he is not dressing up. He is wearing an ordinary painter smock, that red undercoat, under shirt, if you will. And that is very unlike what he did much when he was much younger and he dressed himself in this outlandish costume. But back to the two of, of Rembrandt later in life. Um, you can see the broad and heavy brush strokes. It's hard to do with a slide, but when you stand in front of these, the paint is almost on top of the picture. Um, and it's almost done in a rough manner. And he layers the paint on very thickly, especially in the face, and then again, very thinly in the mantle. Um, he was very, he, Rembrandt, was very famous for this virtuoso technique and combining very different brush strokes and this somewhat sketchy way of painting. However, um, he also shows you the signs of aging here and adversity. In both, he has pouches under the eyes, the brow is furrowed, double chin. Um, and this style in the 1650s already, and particularly in the 60s, was no longer en vogue. It had gone out of fashion. Rembrandt had gone bankrupt. When he painted these, he had already had his bankruptcy behind him. Although he always, until his death, had customers, he never regained his earlier popularity during his life, and he died pretty much a pauper. And yet today, we of course recognize him as one of the greatest painters ever, uh, especially because of his use of light. You might say that he dips his brushes in light as if it were paint, and he makes every scene come alive that way. Now, what was fashionable then in those days for a portrait? This totally different painting here on the right is by Gerrit Dauk from Leiden, my hometown. And he paints a self-portrait that is now uniquely, I, I don't mean uniquely, tremendously popular. Super detail, uh, jewel-like finishes. Um, he paints these with brushes that contain only three hairs. And these brushes were so special that he had to make them himself. Now, this apparently sold, again, like hotcakes, this kind of painting. Uh, he's displaying the tools of his trade, his palette and his brushes, and also a book. Uh, look here, same, uh, same painter, same year, same type of scene, self-portrait. But here we see the palette, the brushes, the book, but also the head of a sculpture. And we can ask, what are these props doing here? Now, these refer to a debate that went on in the Renaissance already. It was called the Paragone. And the Paragone was basically an ongoing competition between people who created paintings, sculpture, and poetry. And it was about who is the best at representing nature? Well, Dao shows here that painting wins it because he can show sculpture and the printed paper. And re he reinforces thereby the notion that painting is the top art. Mm -hmm. Now, this Paragone debate was actually in the 1650s very popular in Leiden because the painters there, and there were lots of them, wanted to create a guild. And in order to, because that would give them economic protection and uh, there were laws that help, helped people in guilds um, get, uh, get more money, very simply. So it was important for Dow to show that painters really won the game. Now, I can't uh, do a talk on Dutch 1770 art, 17th century art without, of course, touching on Vermeer, our very last painting here. And here we have a young woman with a water pitcher from around 1662. Um, 
We know mighty little about Vermeer. We assume he was mostly self-trained, although nowadays people seem to find some indications that he had some schooling. It's, it's quite unknown. Um, this is a, quite a small painting. It was done in Delft, and it is, of course, again, a genre painting. It's not a portrait, it's not a story, and it's certainly not any kind of lesson. It's just a young woman opening a window, holding a water pitcher. It's a quiet atmosphere. It's a very simple domestic moment, totally different from the dissolute household that Jan Steen has just shown us. How did Vermeer achieve this? We can point to three uh, characteristics of, of um, Vermeer. His composition and color, his powers of observation and hence detail, and his use of light. Let's start with the composition. Oh, uh, sorry, one sec. Do you notice that it's basically a very stable triangle, the form of the woman herself? And around her are a bunch of rectangles, the window, the map on the wall, and the table. And um, when he, um, and we, we see that the finial that holds that map down um, meets her head right where, it meet, where the head uh, meets the shoulder, and that focuses our gaze right away on that head. So a very calm composition. Um, in the shoulders and the skirt, you may notice that the lines are somewhat blurred, the outlines. And Vermeer does this very much on purpose. He puts line a tiny bit next to the next line, and he creates thereby an effect of motion. And because you could see this woman is standing still, but she's not static. This is very similar to the effect that we see in a sports photo when you have a diver jumping off a high board and the photo is blurred on purpose. You get the sense of, yeah, there he goes. That's what uh, Vermeer is doing here in a very, very subtle manner. And look at the colors, basically primary colors, reds, blues, and yellows, um, with infinite variations. And um, these colors lead our eyes around in an in a easy way from that multicolored tablecloth which is an oriental carpet. It's a very Dutch thing to do, to put an oriental carpet on the table, um, to the blue of the skirt, into the blue of the window, and back through the girl to that yellow of the map, all very calm. Now, notice um, the infinite detail Vermeer observes. Do you see that the tablecloth is reflected in the bottom of the bowl, and that the jewelry box itself is reflected on the picture. And at the very far right edge of the jewelry box, you see a string of pearls on a little blue ribbon, very small detail. And then the chair behind, it has that little lion head that was very typical for chairs at the time. And then there's a big blue cloth or jacket that has the uh, function of pushing the bowl and the jewelry box closer into our space. Um, and then we look at his use of light. The light that creates these reflections all comes through that stained glass window, that filtered uh, window, filtered through bluish glass. But where the window is open, you can see the sun, sunlight coming in, warming that pale wall, and also just lighting up the woman's face through her white cloth. Um, he is casting a soft light on that face um, with, with, that, with the, the sunlight from the open part of the window, if you can see that. Well, I love to sum up this painting with a quote from a historian who I very much admire. And it says, Vermeer invites us to observe from a distance a woman doing the simplest task in simple surroundings with loving care. She seems to have been transplanted from ordinary existence into a clear and harmonious setting where words have no sound as a figure we see in a dream. And that's the end of the quote. Mm -hmm. And Vermeer gives us a quiet moment. Vermeer gives us time out. 
And with that, I'm afraid we are out of time. And here I am uh, giving you a quick uh, overview of what we have talked about, and I would be more than delighted uh, if I can to answer some questions. <laughs>